Hello? Yeah? Check. Uh, good evening everybody, buonasera a tutti, grazie di essere venuti, quelli che venite da lontano o da vicino. Uh, sono molto felice, I'm really happy to, to welcome today uh, Cristina Sili. Uh, she's been uh, working and dialoguing with the artists in residence at Fabrica today, the whole day, with her master class. And we are lucky enough to have a, a lecture and hopefully uh, an exchange after the lecture in the form of a Q&A, so you're open, please, to participate. And uh, I'm really happy to, to have uh, Christina Silly in our pr semester program, Co-Ecologies, and I think that she, in a way, uh, perfectly feeds and, and resonates with the program that we've been following up in the last semester, and I think that it's been quite a successful uh, day today with the residents. And as always, I, I just want to make a little introduction of, of, of Christina. Uh, Christina Silly's research is based on a deep relationship to the natural uh, world, and it's also born out of a deep connection of field work 
uh, also developing uh, straight and long connections with climate scientists in some of the most harsh environments of the planet. Uh, in a mix of different or in the intersection of art, science and spirituality, her work often uh, pushes the limits of perception in the photographical media. Her works also encourage uh, new ways of sensing the self and faces complex emotions related to our coexistence with climate collapse and of course nature in a wider sense. She has exhibited extensively in the US and internationally and is featured in many public and private collections including the Museum of Contemporary Photography, the West Collection and the Walker Art Center. And she has been an artist in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts in California and also participated in the Art Circle program as well as recipient of a year-long public arts commission from the city of San Francisco. In 2014, she received the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship and she was 2017 recipient of the John Goodman Photography Fellowship. Uh, her exhibition, the, the Next of Kin, seeing extinction through an artist's lens, opened at the Harvard Museum of Natural History in 2017. And her solo exhibitions, Dissonance and Disturbance, the open in, at the Anchorage Museum in Alaska. She has received the master, the MFA in photography of Royal Island School of Design and has completed a self-designed master's in theological studies at Harvard Divinity School in 2023, recently. And uh, in certain ways, she's actually represented by Equinom Gallery in San Francisco and is also a 2023 Guggenheim Fellow. So we're very happy and proud of having Christina Sili in our program and welcome and thank you very much for being here, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody, can then I get, it's gonna take me a second to get used to this mic, Madonna mic. Okay. <laughs> okay, hello. Um, Thank you so much, Carlos, for that kind introduction and for inviting me to be here with all of you. It's um, a, a pleasure and an honor to be part of this Co-Ecologies program and conversation. And I wanna thank Laura Dana and Francesca and um, there's quite a lot of people that have been <laughs> helping me um, today and I just thank you for everybody. The, the network of support's been really um, beautiful and, and uh, powerful. Um, uh, let's see, so to start. So to start uh, from a life within a uh, deeply dedicated, we'll start again, within a life deeply dedicated to the complexity of our fraught relationship to the natural world, I would like to acknowledge that my work increasingly sits in relationship to indigenous ways of knowing. In this, I want to acknowledge these ancient philosophies at the start of the talk. And their, shep um, and their shepherds as powerful and important guides with deepest gratitude and humility. I would also like to acknowledge the land as a living entity in its own right. And lastly, I want to acknowledge that we are all interconnected and entangled family as both humans and non-humans uh, life on this planet. So I lead a life at the intersection of science and the spiritual as a photographic artist focused on issues related to the climate crisis prompted by profound personal questions that surfaced during COVID in 2021. Um, at this time of extreme ecological urgency, I applied and was accepted into a degree program at Harvard Divinity School uh, with the aim to gain in-depth spiritual literacy that would enrich the potent skill sets I've acquired through a bespoke rigorous creative practice over the last two decades. Through a self-designed master's in theological studies over the last two years, I've been unpacking the untapped potential contemporary art has as a powerful conduit for meaning making and a space of spiritual holding as we grapple with the, mo the most pressing existential questions brought on by global environmental devastation. This is one of the first talks I've given in which I name some of the ways in which this experience in divinity school has compounded, um, uh, at, that was compounded by living through COVID is shifting my practice. 
there's so many things I'm still processing, but there are a few things I'd like to name as I start. One is that I do not consider myself a photographer in the traditional sense. Instead, I understand myself as an artist that uses photographic media or recorded media to translate ideas. You'll see later I'm um, now working in sound and video and it's, it's, ev it's evolved quite a bit over the last couple decades. I rarely document in any straight way when I photograph, which has many uses, photography does, but can be considered as a form of separating the self and in ways othering the world as much as the aim may be to shed light on it. I guess I'd describe mine as a kind of embodied photography. I use media to feel into the world, mediation to point back at our perspectival sensorial limits. I use the medium to talk about the medium, and it's always been this way. Often bearing first-hand witness alongside scientists in the field as the climate crisis has evolved, the arc of my practice maps our increasingly tenuous relationship with the natural world or the non-human uh, living world. And in using these tools, I am trying to help us find our way back, to back into our bodies, to remember that we are sensorial beings who were once highly attuned and interconnected with this world. The other thing I want to be sure to acknowledge is that we're inside of a massive, multi-layered cultural shift, unprecedented in human history. We often forget to mention it, actually, and I would argue out of protection, this is out of protection, and because we are not fully equipped yet to face the full force of what it brings up. In a short time, our sense of collective and individual safety has been shaken by the pandemic, Increasingly regular gun violence in the U.S. in particular, which is very tangible in my life. Um, national and international political instability amplified dramatically with the recent situation in Gaza and the Ukraine. And the exponential impacts of the climate crisis seen practically everywhere. And these are all entangled with each other. Along with this, in under a decade, the sense of our location in time and space has dramatically shifted from a paradigm of linear chronologic thinking to simultaneity, so think everywhere, everything everywhere all at once. We now get information in a way and at a rate we are not designed as human animals to m metabolize, which is inherently also designed to activate our fear response, so our attention is maintained and managed. Even for the most privileged of us sitting here in this room with most of our basic needs met, it is a fundamentally overwhelming time to be alive. This means that we're all holding different degrees of trauma with us today. And that we're, when we're together trying to relate, if we do not honor these realities and name the related emotions in the room and learn how to metabolize them in a healthy way, they can get the better of us and keep us from communicating the connection we need as social animals and from moving forward together in generative ways. I mention this as my role as an artist, I have to keep in mind the context within which I'm working and the state of the audience that will be receiving my work. If I skip or overlook where they are, then my ideas be can become useless. And the very work I hope to do is to help you see and feel things a bit differently, to deal with these traumas in small ways and hopefully to come out the other side feeling more connected, entangled, and inspired to rethink your positionality. So next I would like to talk about semantics. And we've touched on this a bit today and uh, when working with the residents, which has been a real pleasure. Um, so because an interesting realization hit me when I applied to divinity school, I am really thinking about, again, the semantics, the power of them. So when pulling together my application, I suddenly registered that I only had to change a few words, and there it was. It turns out, as a secular, non-religious being, I had been living a deeply spiritual life. So I want to consider what it looks like to share my practice publicly from this lens. What changes when an artist directly names their practice as sacred? Do you find more of the sacred in your own life if I say it out loud? And as a side, I suspect every one of you in the room called to do this kind of creative work already feels in some way, shape, or form like this is true for you. I've spent more than a decade in deep communion with the planet, and I moved to the Arctic for six months early in my career, inspired by a boat trip to Alaska, during which I was directly exposed to the obvious early impacts of the climate crisis. It was 2009. In 2010, I moved north because I had to, following the unfaltering needle of a compass in me. 
there was no other option than to listen and go, and to the residents and budding artists in the audience, I left an unstudied job, adjunct teaching with little savings and with blind faith. I threw myself into the work of finding my th way through by building my creative practice over this six month stint. With now, without knowing it, it was the start of, to, of a deeply dedicated spiritual life. And now looking back, I see it as one that has always been about trying to express the existential need for our re-entanglement with the planet. Um, and it's become exponentially louder as the years have passed. So as a side, in these last few images, you're seeing um, me on different trips um, and uh, experiencing perpetual night on the shores of the Arctic Ocean near the town of Ukiavik, which is also known as Barrow, Alaska on the north, most northern shore of Alaska. Um, and it's uh, the one with the Polaroid you saw is, is from Greenland, the Greenland Ice Sheet. And it's from a, a, a video you'll see a bit about later, a, a bit of later called Dissonance. Um, and I, this image here, I'm sitting on the frozen Arctic Ocean, which is a pretty profound thing to think of being on a frozen ocean, wearing everything you see on the right. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my whole suitcase as one outfit. So the blue coat is good for about 40 below. And every time I went up that way, I would borrow this coat from a doctor friend who would work sometimes up, up on the North Slope. And um, I would like put on this, this like dirty coat and <laughs> suddenly look like a five-year-old in, you know, in my, my gear. But it really it was a little cave of warmth. Um, so before I share some of my projects from this lens, I wanted to talk about the in-between. So we are designed to be in relation. And that means our bodily tools as a set of our specific five senses is meant to take in the world as a part of the world. That means we are supposed to know ourselves as beings in relation to land, nature, place, human, and non-human communities. It is no wonder there, is an, there are epidemics of anxiety, depression, and loneliness. We are not meant to be on our own with so few chances to use our whole sensorial design. It's disorienting to say the least, and it in itself is a kind of trauma. So what I'm most interested in these days is how we might move differently through the world if we were less focused on individual entities and more focused on what exists between individual humans and non-humans alike. What happens when we notice the space between us? It's not the body's edge. It's not the internal world or the external. It's not the vacuum, it's not where you are, it's not where you are not. It is where the music is, it is the reach of love, the direction of a voice, the pathway of a stare, the evaporation of salt off a cheek, the reverberation of the pumping life beat, the tiny tender jurisdiction of body heat pulling off the skin, it is the path of flight, the air under wings, ripples on a glassy surface. It is the charge of air just outside drops of rain as they fall, the space below a cloud, the warm air of a song being sung. It's a thought set free. It's the push of air near a peak. It's everything that happens when we close our eyes. So I wanna ask all of you to think about the in-between and the site of relationality. So not you or me, not you and a ruby-throated hummingbird, not you and the land beneath your feet, but what's between us. So I'm gonna ask you to do a little exercise with me <laughs> to try to help you shift into thinking from a place of relationality before I share my work. And we've done a lot of this today as a group with the residents, but for the rest of you, it'll help us get you caught up <laughs> with the group. Um, and I wanna encourage you to listen from your body or a more embodied, contextualized location if you can. So pick a place you love in your mind's eye. It could be the natural world or a city, doesn't matter. And close your eyes for a minute if you feel comfortable and picture it for yourself. So picture a circle, or if you have a notebook, you can even write it down. Use a page and create a circle in the center in your mind, or essentially you can also make this as a note. And then, Here's me blurry me, fill yourself in. You're in the middle of this. You can open your eyes again too now. And then start to think about what you're in relationship to, so other beings in that favorite environment. 
They can be animals or plants, insects, bodies of water, other humans, soil. And now get specific, specific if you can. So say like a raccoon or the Italian sparrow, which is the national bird here, <laughs> or a red fox or maple trees. Or if you don't know the names of species, just visualize them in their context. Okay, so now think about the whole environment that all of these beings exist in. And all of these beings in motion in their lives. And then think about them existing without you there. How often do we do that? And then all the ways they relate to each other and remember you're at the center, right? We're moving through the, our lives. So here, I invite you to consider the lines as sites of relationality and connection. What shifts when we cultivate there or perceive there from there and listen from there? And I acknowledge that a lot of us have nervous systems that are amped up and we don't always feel safe and this can be a practice in your mind's eye that can actually calm your nervous system down because you realize you're connected to everything. So I'm gonna share a few projects from this location of relationality, and let's say sacred relationality to bring that, that word into the room. In 2016, I started working on my project Terra Sistema at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Station on the island of Barrow, Colorado in the Panama Canal, and returned to finish it in 2017. The goal was to try to capture a sense of the breadth of the rainforest through photographic media for the first half of the project. This meant keeping in my mind the way plants breathe and synthesize light, so photosynthesis, through the chlorophyll, which makes up the green we relate with plant material. So I purposely overexposed the film and video to amplify the feeling of light coming through and the translucency of plants and use their, the idea of wind or movement to relate to our sense of breath. This half of the project, called Respiro, or breath, um, centers around translating the tropical rainforest belt as a kinetic living breathing system. This meant over two years I spent a great deal of time in deep meditative communion with this small pocket of the rainforest. Essentially I learned to lose my edges and breathe with the world around me, consider it as an entity in its own right in the act of living, and to honor it through the act of trying to translate this idea. The shooting process was made up of many daily rounds of setting up and taking down a four by five, so an old school, you know, like dark cloth over your head, <laughs> analog camera, and a DSLR you, you see there. Um, and these two kits, you know, that I was sort of managing in extreme heat and humidity with a great deal of time waiting for the light and air and wind to, to get the desired shots. But it really changed the way I spent time in forests and paid attention to all the life that is happening around and as, a, and as systems, right? Um, the jungle is so dense. And it was not only building this sense of direct relationality with the environment, but also working alongside fellow researchers doing the same from a scientific angle. So there were primate researchers, so this on um, your left <laughs> is a, a ladder up to research cappuccino and howler monkey habitats. And the canal was being expanded my first year, so there were studies being done to protect species as best as possible, but you can imagine how powerful that impact must have been to expand that canal. And then um, the size of the ships that it can now go through there, it's insane, it's incredible. So there were researchers from Dartmouth College where I, I had been teaching for, and just um, I stepped down this summer, but I was there for about eight years. Um, and they were reco recording in a tiny recording studio the call of 75 indi individual species of katydids, which you see here, I'm shaking the, the pendril of the, the katydid. This is katydid, the katydid. Uh, they're like crickets. And to try, they're trying to understand how each species finds each other in a sonically noisy world, right? So if you, there's like very specific shifts in them. So this is me again shaking the hand of one of them, but and they had this little <laughs> tiny recording studio which had, which had a teeny tiny mic, and then they'd have the Katie, Katie did there like singing into a mic. It was pretty amazing. Um, and then on the right is a relic of a kit that well before low light digital gear existed, designed by a famous bat researcher who figured out how to photograph bats in motion at night with a set of flashes seen here like a strobe effect. So it's kind of cool to see that there's in this little station some remnants of 
previous modes, like creative modes of trying to, you know, write, um, uh, gather data, very similar to being an artist, actually. Um, and I also went out at night with a frog, or frog and bat researchers at one night, and we used infrared, they used infrared cameras to do their work in the dark. So this is a portrait of all us warm-blooded animals <laughs> together uh, using their gear. Um, but my work turned into a set of long, still exposures and video work that situated the viewer within the motion of the breath of the canopy and traces the kinetic regular interplay of light and air within this living system. So the photographic works are made up of two prints layered onto each other. It's very hard to translate in, a, in this projection because they're really, um, they're really different. They translate differently in real life. They're layered and there's this kind of top archival vellum print as like almost like a skin or something. And that's backed by the second really sharp digital print. So they kind of like combine and become dimensional. And these disparate exposures um, then like have this sensation of dimension and trace and motion as the viewer moves past each piece. And then I photograph so you purposely have no footing, like so you're, you feel kind of floating, you're floating in this world. And it's often difficult to tell how to orient yourself to the environment to enhance the feeling of being integrated. So the images are designed to compound and confuse photographic time as to set the viewer within this conti the continuousness of the cycle. While they're hard to translate on the screen, the top print, again, almost reads like that a skin. So you really, there's like a warmth to them too. That's, uh, and they're breathing. Actually, that material, if anyone's used it, is like depending on the humidity changes, it's, as it's alive in a way. It's a different kind of print. And then in two six 2016 and 2017, I was also invited through the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth, where, who I worked with quite a lot when I was there, to go to Greenland, which was a great honor, to offer a workshop for their JSET program, which is a joint science education program. And um, the grad students and faculty ran this program, they're still doing it, um, where they bring high school students from Denmark, Greenland, and the US, and they learn science in situ, like in Greenland on the ice sheet, it's amazing. And so I would do these um, cyanotype workshops with them, and we'd have this engagement and talk about art, and then I'd go and do my, my work. Um, and so in response to the, a growing concern about the alarming rate of melt off the ice sheet, I traveled to Kangaroosak over the next two summers, which is a Greenlandic town on the um, west coast. It's one of the only towns you can access the ice sheet directly. And I began a series of similar works to play out the kinetic life of the ice sheet melt, concentrating on the accumulation and movement of water of this mass country of ice. The work Flumen, or Flow, which is the other half in conversation with Respiro, follows the path of water starting as glistening drips of melting ice that cumulatively build to an exponential force, one that's powerful enough to affect the balance of our entire planet by altering the stability of its circulatory system or our network of ocean currents. The scale of water is far more difficult to translate and than trees, and so the first year I came away with almost nothing um, for this uh, project, and I was actually there to photograph muskox and caribou for another project, Species Impact, which I'll barely I'll sort of touch on a little bit, but that ended up in the this exhibition that Carlos mentioned at the Har Harvard Natural History Museum. That I over four years I photographed ten, ten photographed ten species in the wild that were being impacted by a climate crisis. Um, and then the second year, I spent a great deal of time listening to the ice and water and recording it in different ways. And I'd gone back, the first year was this kind of failure. And then I came back and like r used a river near where I was living to really figure out water and how to have this engagement with it and record it. And so did all these tests and so that, cause you know, it's really hard to get there. It's like, impact, you're expensive, all of it. It takes like 42 hours, you know, to get to this land there. So I had to use my time really well. Um, and I learned a lot, you know, a lot of <laughs> being an artist is failing and learning from failure, right? So this is here, you see me just um, really like <laughs> with the water and filming it and scouting. These are called Mulans, the kind of like a uh, water slide looking um, uh, little uh, creeks that move through the ice sheet. And then Kangalusak is set at the edge of a large fjord in a Greenlandic town that has developed over a defunct, out of a defunct uh, army base, um, American army base. It has one of very few airports in the country that is large enough to allow both government and commercial airlines to land. And so, and so it also means, I'll go back, so it means that you see this, the, that's, it's called KISS, it's like Kangaroo Science Research Station, which it, um, 
And uh, so all these scientists now come, because of this infrastructure, come to this particular point, and uh, it's like very basic living, uh, you know, um, quarters, and then you go out every day, and, and you know, there's scientists from all over the world there researching in different ways. And you can see it's a harsh environment, so you have to check out, you have to write when you're, where you're you have a satellite phone, you have to um, sign in and out, and if you don't come back within an hour of when you said you're coming back, they'll come and find you, you know? So it's like kind of an intense experience. Um, you get used to it, but it's just a different kind of way of being out in it. So the longest road in Greenland is a 25 mile rough dirt road, and it runs from the town's edge to the edge of the ice sheet. To so kind of, you see that, that's my, or the car, is like car hiking kind of. And it also is one of the only places to access, again, like I mentioned, the edge of the ice sheet in Greenland by foot in particular. Um, so at the end of the road, you can walk up onto a glacial moraine and out onto the ice. And you'll see in a second here, you're starting to see the ice sheet. So the Greenland ice sheet makes up 80% of the country and is 660,200 square miles. That's a massive piece of ice, right? And then during my time there, and just to note, I was on like the teeniest, tiniest edge of it, you know, it's like massive, you know, we're just like a mile in maybe, you know, that's it. So during my time there, I also lived and worked as an artist alongside my science colleagues who were interpreting this landscape from differing but complementary perspectives. And on the left is uh, Ross Virginia, who's the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies, and he was a very important player for me as an academic also artist and a research-based artist because he would immediately, when I got this job at Dartmouth, he just brought me into the room of every conversation and major players were coming in to talk, from the Arctic in particular, to talk about what was going on. And he took very seriously the role that art could play in the, in the storytelling and the, the holes and the gaps that in, in the science, right? So it was a really changed and, and in, I think invigorated my sense of like the importance of the kind of research I was doing, which was more embodied research. I have freedoms in a way that my science colleagues did not. So for the water piece, I used two different lengths of exposure and did the same kind of like in combining between the print where there's a vellum on the top and then you know, there's, there's like sometimes a soft print on the front and a sharp one in the back or vice versa. And if you took off the top layer and you looked at <laughs> the back print, it looks crazy. You'd never, you'd like over sharpen it and it looks like kind of in insane. But because the vellum softening it, you know, it sort of activates it. And again, it feels like the water's in motion. And instead there's this feeling of perpetuity, like so the I hoping that it feels like the water's moving. And um, they, there's again this sense of trace and motion as you, as you move too. So there's no edge of time. And so that's you know, something thinking about water too, right? There's no edge to the, ed the, the temporal scape of the photograph, which we're used to thinking of like the photograph as a, as a discrete moment. And these are really meant to like blow that up in, and they're just, they're right, they're sort of like sense of, of this motion going, happening. And then here's just them installed in an exhibition at my gallery, and then, and then I made a, handmade a artist book with uh, John DeMeritt, who's an incredible bookmaker, built it, but I printed it all and designed it, and then you just, it's just like a book version of that. Um, and then the dual screen video installation, Terra System, a tempo interweaves and overlays real time footage of each system in action, like mirror, almost mimicking that like exchange of the, the, the prints. And then it stages the viewer between these large scale projections of breath and current, and they play out simultaneously as delicate and powerful forfeit forces again in perpetuity. They're just kind of looped. And there's sound too. So the viewer is not only invited to consider the planet as a mirrored, breathing, circulating self, but becomes the bridge between the two locations as like an active location of relational in-between, right? So you're literally like connecting the Arctic and the tropics as the, as the experiencer. So these profound experiences communing with both the rainforest and the ice sheet led me in the following years um, further into the territory of embodiment and inspired my two most recent works. Disturbance, which debuted at the Anchorage Museum last fall, is an immersive audio-visual installation focused on the dramatic recurrent audio interruptions that disrupt natural sonic environments that are generated by large-scale industrial ma man-made machines. And then these, you know, cargo ships and flights function as part of a complex worldwide network of cargo. 
So the project was inspired by an experience I had 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago, photographing for a, another project called Markers of Time, where I w had moved up to Alaska to, to, and, then, and then eventually worked in the tropics after that, but to experience perpetual day to perpetual night and make work about our, like, lose, our lost relationship with natural cycles. And so I was there, like, really paying attention to man-made time and natural time, and so flights and the tide and all that. And I was photographing, um, and I had, had this crazy experience where I was just below where the flights take off out of Anchorage Airport. And there's this little weird park. <laughs> it's kind of a funny park. And um, it's it, there's this crazy sonic phenomenon where there's a, you know, there's this cliff face and then the flights are coming overhead and then there's a bay in front of you and the acoustics of water are crazy right so if, if sound hits them it just like spreads in this incredibly crazy way um, and so the fl flights will come out over them right below that you know like under this this um, this cliff and then just drop through your body like the sound comes busts out and like drops through you and just like it's terrifying you know and even if you expect it to happen it's like actually scares the crap out of you it's just like terrifying like your your nervous system kicks in no matter what right um so that really actually was i, I filed it away like i have to do something with this sound that someday um, and then i was having a related experience in panama and so what I, I come to notice while working in Baro Colorado, on the island, Baro Colorado, was this eerie, unsettling feeling. You know, so I'm in the jungle, it's loud, like there's all this sound. There are these howler monkeys that are, sound like dragons, there's a crazy sound, and all these birds and frogs and, you know, so much going on, Katie did all of it. And then I would notice, I would feel like uh, multiple times a day of kind of like unease, and my nervous system would like kick, kick into fear mode a little bit, but I didn't really understand why. And it took me a while to figure out that it was the fact that these massive ships were going by before I, and I could, I could feel them before I could hear them. So the bass was like, something was off, right? And, and bass in the natural world is almost always dangerous, right? So like a herd of buffalo or a flood or something, you know, it's never like, oh, yay, <laughs> like celebrate. It's like scare your, your body knows to have like this fear-based response, right? So un unless you're right at the edge of the island, also you don't see the ships go by, right? In the Arctic, there's just expanse and space and you really like, you're very aware of like everything that's alive or not or moving, right? In the jungle, you have like so much is going on. So um, that's an, it was this really like really starting to learn about embodiment right and this like registration of that and here you see the conversation of these are sonograms or really like these sort of like um, translations uh, synesthetic translations of sound into visual and it's designed to pull this project designed to pull apart and draw attention to the battling experience of sonic scapes that are made up of biophony which is the natural soundscape and anthropophony, which is the man-made sound sources, in these two disparate geolog geological locations. So again, I'm interested in this, like Arctic tropics, as a way to think about the whole of the globe, right? These like regions in our collective imagination that actually really make you start to think of about a global uh, narrative in a way. Um, and so this it centers on this ongoing natural ambient frequencies, starting with the natural ambient frequencies and that exist within these each respective environments, and they're unhinged by these intervals of profound human-induced disruption, and regularly, right? There's like a rhythm to that. So the interplay of these, these um, audio, natural, man-made, and locational Arctic tropic components amplify the vastness of this man-made global system and network, and the intensity and pervasiveness of its impact on a planetary scale. So here's where this is from when I, way back when I started, I was just doing these long exposures of these flights, like flight and tide conversation. And then so this, these seem very quiet, quiet as images, and it was absolutely like terrifyingly loud actually, and very disruptive that, and we're so used to jets coming back, and here you can see that, that like burst, a uh, disruptive burst in the sonogram, right? And then here you can see, you can see, we talked about this a little bit today, where there's this sort of orchestra of, you know, this, you feel like the score of the natural world on the left in the jungle, you have like birds and the, you know, the frogs that are the high notes and the middle ground and then, the, you know, even the howler monkeys have like a deep bass kind of, and so they're sort of low, and then you see this fog of a arc of the ship going by and everybody gets quiet, right? It's just fog of ship. 
Um, so I, was, I, I worked with um, Chris, Christopher Hedge on this because I didn't speak sound, I, you know, and I wanted to really create this experiential sound. And he's an audio engineer that's been working for many years on the three-dimensional sound at the Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. They have a big planetary, you know, like dome. And, um, and it was amazing to work with him. I learned so much. And we, we were using a Talingo, which is what you can see with that. This is him in both regions and Alaska and, and the tropics in uh, Panama. And then here, it, the, a holophone and binaural. So the holophone is this middle one that has six mics on in one dome. And then the f there's like a 5-1 install. Some people know sound, some people don't, which just means in a space you'd have five speakers, one in the middle, four in one in each corner, and a subwoofer. And so you're recording to then remap that into a space. And then binaurals are, are just designed to emulate the way you hear. So you see the little <laughs> our little mannequin friend. You can either wear them yourself, so you're recording the way you hear, or you have a mannequin that's doing that. So, And they're really designed a little more. We weren't sure how we were going to install it, so you could also have this, like, you used headphones to really make that work. And it's very deceptive. If you've ever experienced it, sometimes uh, there's a very famous or, or well-known artist, Janet Cardiff, that does these walks and you're listening, and you, sometimes you really can't tell what's in the recording and what's outside. It's a wild experience. So, so I really wanted to play with, like, trying to get your body to register it as, as like, a dimensional experience. So just here we are listening in, in it. And then here you can see the cargo ship just going by. And I was just kind of filming. I, this was meant to be sonic, and you see there's, like, this frog there that's you can't even imagine the, the impact on it, the sensorial experience of for these, these guys that are so reliant on sound, right? And delicate, and, and, and that's their worlding, so. And then I, when we went to Alaska to shoot, I'd lived, I'd been living up there years, a couple years before, so I have a like, nice community there, and I went and stayed with a friend of mine. And this, we happened to arrive there right, like a day or two days after this major earthquake, actually. And I grew up in the Bay Area in Berkeley, and I grew up with earthquakes and, like, very aware of also, like, that vibratory, sensorial, like, you, you know, get in a door frame kind of, you know, um, experience. So what was crazy is that he had this four-panel painting a friend had made, and this is what the earthquake did to it, which was kind of amazing, right? So he just left it. He's like, I'm just going to leave it. It's like a mark of this thing happening. And then we, what we were doing then, we went down back to that location. It was really slick, so we had these crampons and we were like sliding down on our butt. It was so slippery and it, like climate change, but it was supposed to be snowy and it was just a weird time. The weather was crazy. But anyway, the, the, the flights are taking off, but we're having like aftershocks. So I'm like sitting on these earthquakes while like these two things are happening and it was really wild. It was pretty crazy. And then here you can just see it's part of like being a photographer in this, you just the weather is, is a, a something you have to keep in mind. And um, yeah, we're just sort of trying to collaborate. <laughs> and then here's the, the flights taking off. And then just to give a sense of like, the piece can be design it, designed in a range of ways to be retrofitted so it's all in one space and there's either like a, a screen where you can project on both sides or two screens or et cetera. But in, in, in a minute, I'll show you what the first, the Anchorage Museum is a little different where they had two little theaters right across from each other, which was kind of a cool thing to work out. So this is like immersive sound. And so here we are editing it in situ. So the thing is, he, uh, he, we're in the middle of COVID. He lives in uh, San Francisco. I was living on the East Coast. We had to fly to Anchorage to then. You can't edit that like on the phone or something, you know, like by Zoom because it's about experience, the experiential part of it. So we had to edit it, like go and stay there for five days and edit it in the space. And it was really it was kind of amazing experience. So. We, and so the the vibe was that we're um, building this conversation between these two rooms, right? And so I was the the video is meant to just be secondary. I flipped it to point to the language of oil. So thinking about the fossil fuel industry in relationship to cargo, here you can hear some of the sound. Um, and and then these are in two separate rooms, um, but the arc of the sound composition had this like crescendo where there's like a rainstorm and like nature kind of like reclaims the sonic space and in the, the way we d dealt with it. And there's a point where there's like lots of cargo, you know, and sounds of ship and, and, and jets, but then 
again, you get like, you really realize, you really realize like how loud actually this, the natural world is in a, you know, this sort of, they need it, they need to be loud. And so again, the video is kind of secondary to the sound, but it's an anchor point. So I was explaining to the, the residents today that what was challenging about making it just sound is that it's kind of disorienting unless you have some kind of chronologic anchor, visual anchor in a way, right? So, so just thinking about the complexity of like what I wanted to talk about, but also like I, was, I know what the world is that I was in when and what it looked like. So to just give you that kind of anchor and the way I was making. And then there's a series of, um, so there's this other little gallery and there's a um, set of prints called the Sea and Air. And they inherit this, you know, the Sea and Air um, prints actually inherently speak also to this historical and contemporary, they have like the whole project has colonial implications too of like global industrialization, not only in these regions, but it's pervasive uh, ongoing impact on a planetary scale and on planetary systemics. So. Um, there's this kind of layered metaphor for the eco-social political moment we're living within. And these prints um, were designed again in dialogue with the inverted video and, then, and they're printed on this metallic paper so they have a sheen like oil. Um, and then they're visualizing like the cargo ships and flights from each location. And in the flights I was trying to think of sort of like visualizing sound so each kind of entity has its own sonic you know, space in these and thinking about that, like layering, how do you sort of talk about that visually? Um, and then in the cargo work, there's this like the, the cargo ships just can't integrate with the, right, this like sharp edged non-organic shape. It just like cannot blend in with the, um, the, the natural environment and the natural sort of organic form of the jungle. And here's just the installation. Okay, and the last is the last project I'll talk about. And then a minute, there's sort of a little uh, conversation to have that I'll end this with. But um, in 2019, the hottest year on record, I also returned to the ice sheet and created the film Dissonance, um, the other project that came directly out of my experience working on Terra Sistema in Greenland. Um, and it's my most personal project probably, it's kind of a love letter to uh, Greenland and the Arctic. Um, and the video, and, and uh, that, that year, again, was a hottest year on record, and there's, there are quite a few stories, like a polar bear cub showed up 100 miles out of its range, and it was emaciated, and we had to, you know, there's all this protocol, because they're dangerous, they'll attack humans, they'll eat, they, they rarely eat them, but they do attack humans because they're predators. And so it, there was this whole, we had to do all this bear training and I was, I've been in quite a few places where there are polar bears, so I was training the grad stu <laughs> students to manage them and it was, there was this cognitive dissonance because we never saw the bear, but there was this deep, just deep grief that really rose up in me. I think it was like hitting, a, it was really hitting a point after so many years of really being inside of witness of this, of changes happening. And the tangible, the bear, I called it ghost bear. It was like always kind of with us. And then, and then it had the a Greenlandic hunter. So the Greenlandic community actually will hunt polar bear and they eat, eat them. They're part of this, the sustenance living. And so someone had to go and, and uh, the year before, and, and they, I think it's the first time in like 100 years I'd seen a polar bear in that part of Greenland. So it was really dramatic. And the year before, the, the mother had, they think it was the mother, had come through and, um, and they had to uh, do the same thing. But they distributed the meat and that she was healthy. And then this year, this, this one was, it was so devastating, it was really sad. So I was just like holding that, I didn't know how to kind of like process it with the grad students who were just like, they don't even know, this is in like, this new territory. Um, and then, th so this video, that w there's this thing that happened and in a minute, I'm gonna share like a piece of writing over the beginning of, of the dissonance. And that's not how it's shown in a space, but you, you'll, you'll understand in a second. But so the video is a single channel video piece that focuses on the dissonance of the bodily experience of this otherworldly and rapidly changing environment. 
The footage centers around interactions with sparkling meltwater as I labored to hold on to small glistening pieces of ice as they melt against the heat of my fingers and hand. Segments of the piece ask the viewer to register in slow motion the kinetic energies of ice from solid to liquid within the magnitude of the surrounding landscape. The interjection of, of my body serves as a conduit for the viewer's experience and the subtle audio of surrounding wind and water mixing with the sound of long exhales of breath fogging the lens. So I like breathe on the lens so you feel the, the like um, sense of the body and my presence. And then the crunch of footsteps on the icy surface um, build into this kind of meditative and chanting but simultaneously loaded narrative. The slow glitching footage creates a surreal edge to the piece and it points back to the impact of mediating technologies on our misunderstanding of the environment. So fundamentally dissonance, dissonance is a reflection of our human vulnerability and our power to impact. The experience of creating the video work led me on my return to write this performative text I'm about to do for you. Um, it's a piece of writing I only share in this context, so live. I only read it when we're in the dark together like this. Um, and the entire actual video piece is 32 minutes and you know, there's immersive sound and you just see it in a space like looping and it's had a couple different revert lives as you saw in that theater. And, um, and you'll see making the video had this profound impact on my understanding of embodied knowing. So I'm gonna kind of maybe ask the, the light gets taken down and shifted to that. I am dissonance. What does it mean to be human in this? What does it mean to be singular, vulnerable, and tender inside the enormity of this moment? Planetary flux. For the third time I climb out onto the edge of this country of ice, Greenland. This time something deep has shifted in me. So much more has changed over such a short time since I was last here. Too much. My psyche is overwhelmed. My soul self silent tries to feel it out. I focus inward. This time I find my own edges, my own pulse, my breath and beat, my own temperatures. I feel my feet on this ground of ice and dust. I smell the crispness of the air here. I feel it actively where my skin is bare. And I listen. I listen from the core of me. I listen like I always do first from that core soul space in me, that guide. But this time I shift deeper. I use the whole of my body. I consider it itself as the conduit for some other way to explain it all to you. I am breakable. We are. I am small in the world. We are. I am animal. I am breathing. I am beating. We are. I'm supposed to report back, to tell you it all in a particular way you can categorize, some familiar trope of story. Yes, I have been there. I have borne witness over the arc of dramatic change, 10 years. And I saw this, and you expect a tidy story, one that we can fit inside of, one we can react to in the usual ways, but this, it is wild and far wider than we can easily comprehend. It is about a deep, entangled dissonance. The only way to translate it authentically is to use my body as a conduit, to posi position yours here with mine to feel your way into this. We must feel our way into this together. That means use our entire bodies, all of our senses, our intuition, our gut feelings, our needs, our humility, our animalness. I am a body of simultaneous privilege and wild vulnerability. I am such sat wide open on this otherworldly stage, listening with all of me, listening so hard I am regularly brought to tears. Years of facing into it, of witness and realizations, ghosts that haunt and facts that I house about all the life impacting change. 
And this, this love affair with the edge of things has been the most important thread in my life. It is also devastatingly beautiful. The way the sunlight amplifies the energies of water and ice moving around me, set here among a zillion diamonds in a system of such visual complexity I don't know where to look. I pick up one small frozen piece from the edge of a flowing Mulan its formation designed by the motion of water and I hold it up into the Arctic sunlight. My fingers freeze in the air and against its tiny glassy surface. The sublimity felt from this examination is infinitely worth the correlated bodily breakdown. I hold it and turn it and feel it in my fingers until they are numb. Then without touch as guide, I grip a bit harder but just enough to keep this gem from slipping. I consider it slowly in the brightness until the heat of my body thins its edge beyond a delicacy I can grasp and it slips back into the twinkling flow of, the all, of it all at my feet. I'm learning about my body, love and impact. The power of my energy is directly affecting another's. This year was the hottest on record. In the valley on the way to the ice sheet, a system of flow winds its way to a fjord and eventually out to sea. This network of meltwater from ice sheet to ocean is visibly comprehensible. My first night in the brightness of the Arctic summer, I climbed the nearby outcropping that looks out over the town of Kangalusak where we stay. It's a breathtaking 360 degree view. And all I could focus on was the sound of the water in a riverway below, like white noise turned up too loud. So much water echoing its motion throughout this wide space. All I could do was feel what this meant with my body, with my full set of senses, to register it as a knowing, the most important kind. We are at an unprecedented moment. I cannot say this loud enough. I come from the front lines. Believe me, I will say it again. We are at an unprecedented moment. All I can say from all that I house is we need to start to collectively think in new and generous ways. Not built out of fear, but built out of inclusivity and possibility. We need to be in and of the world, to feel it more and notice how we are not separate. I usually end with a few lines here, but I wanted to point to even what has changed in such a short time since I wrote this. And this, still, this piece still holds up as we're coming to, a, to a need new ways of perceiving. But that wasn't very long ago, you know, and at that time no one was really paying attention in this really deep crisis way that we are now. And again, this is where the in-between and leaning into where we're in relation um, uh, is and becomes the, the focus where we can reciprocate and synthesize and generate with a sense of belonging and connection. So I want to share just the last couple of things that this piece has changed um, for me and as so much has changed. Um, and, and I'm aware of these sort of new things now and it's been again such a short time. One is we know this is happening, right? The short time ago no one was again really holding this. So what does it mean to shift into the in-between? It doesn't have to be a place rooted in fear or reactivity, but it helps us reconnect and calm our nervous systems down so we can think more clearly. And what we are now thinking about, reciprocation, connection, and generative belonging um, is where we can live from, right, if we're thinking from that. So this, you're seeing this experience I had that I wanted to share that was happened when I was in the Galapagos a few years, a few years ago. And I was trying, um, as you can see, to film the edge of the water. And that kind of edge, that threshold, uh, was like the focus of what I was trying to get to. And I was treading water for a long time with my like DSLR in this case. This, you know, it was just heavy and awkward. And... Um, all of a sudden, the sea lion, like the, what you saw there, right? Like suddenly there's just whiskers. I didn't, I could, all I was looking at was water and it was just like suddenly whiskers. And the sea lion just started to play with me. Um, and she's as big as I am. So, and I'm not in my world, right? I am wildly vulnerable inside her world. And I'm a, I'm a good swimmer, but again, I'm holding gear and 
And, um, you know, I'm sort of just, like, <laughs> trying to, like, have a reaction to this large mammal, uh, you know, and just that's, like, having en engaging with me. And this is all part of a, this is de tempore. It's part of a piece of mine, so the sun's where the sun is, like, sort of perpetually setting and, um, and the sea lion and then the arctic fox are part of this. Um, these have had a lot of really profound experiences uh, in the wild with, with uh, non-human life, and I'm lucky for it. Um, but I, it was so interesting. I had all this gear, and I wanted to cry, and I was, like, afraid, and I was, like, in love, and, I was, and it was just this wild moment where I kind of lost my edges, and I kind of became more of an animal in a way. And there's such a deep humility when you're not in your world. And they're way smarter than we believe. And they're very aware of us. Obviously, she was like, what are you doing, you know? And she kept doing this thing where she <laughs> would swim and then be like, what? You know, just like right and so agile. And then I was with this uh, a friend that was helping me. Um, and I got out after a while. I couldn't. I was exhausted. And the <laughs> she's so sweet. The um, this She was pretty young. She came out and was like... You know, just she wanted to keep playing. She was, like, pouting, kind of. It was so crazy. Um, and so, again, this sort of, like, sense of humility was really starting to bake in to the way I move through the world all the time, actually. And then this is one of my favorite pictures of my mother and I, and she's placing me, I expect, for the first time into my most beloved Lake Superior, Gichigumi, which is where I've spent every summer of my life. And I've been thinking about this image for a long time, and it's, you can see it's faded, so you almost can't even see it. I'm like, I'm, I'm just like a, a shape. And I'm at an age where I most likely didn't know where my human mother or planet mother ended and I began. And I can't help with all that I now house but wonder what it might feel like to find our way back to that sense of self so deeply entangled. So I'm going to end with a provocative thought from one of my favorite thinkers of the day, um, Beo Kumalafe, who the residents read uh, this the, this longer piece, but this is just a part of it. He's a Nigerian born and self described as self describes as an author, celebrated speaker, teacher, and self styled trans public intellectual, and a concept that's been imagined with and inspired by the shamanistic priesthood of the Yorba healer trickster. He's an incredible thinker. Um, post activism, the concept that informs my notion of making sanctuary, this is his quote, is a matter of eruptions eruptions, breakthroughs, cracks, flashes, fissures, fault lines, discontinuities, blasts, splits, rifts, ruptures, seismic shifts, world-ending openings, miracles, strange encounters, and the yawning maw of the monster. It is my way of describing the flows and possibilities that proceed from the moment when things no longer fit. He goes on to ask, what if the world kicks back? He writes, post-activism is not the way I describe a superior form of being that guarantees solution. It's not post in the sense of being a successor narrative, a deeper truth, a sure track to utopian worlds, a formula for saving the world. Instead, it is the site where continuity becomes impossible, where the world and its colonizing completeness feels less compelling than that one riven place that sprouts alien notions, and where the solutions of the highway seem inadequate to annul unusual, more than human arrangement. A frothing crack opens in the ground, enacting a break in the seamless totality and knowability of things, disrupting the exclusivity of human agency and inquiry, dispersing vitality and expanding sociality to include things we hadn't considered. Everything changes, becomes stranger, alien. This is post-activism. When we've come to the end of the rope, to the very end of the world, and there are no more words. This is where art comes in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. It was a beautiful uh, lecture, and maybe now uh, I hope, or maybe there is some questions in in the group, and I'm I'm also in a way impressed, and also I know that you've been very selective on the work. I know a lot of other works that it would would have been fantastic also to to be able to to see, mm -hmm. but uh, if there is no question, maybe I wanted to follow up on 
uh, as we always ask, you know, what's next, no? oh, which sure, is yeah. important for, for us to understand what are you working on and mm -hmm. what do you think is the next uh, project? And yeah. Um, well, I'm working on a few, a few projects now. COVID and just the state of things has really changed my practice. So I don't as easily go off into these, you know, uh, these expeditions. I go on these expeditions so much. Partly because of impact, you know, being mindful of my own impact on the world. But also, I think I'm, there's a kind of, um, I think I'm kind of like gathering back in my energies or something to something a little more close to my body, too, in a way, right? So becoming increasingly interested in, in, in this, again, this idea of the in between. And so I'm working on a few things. So one is a, a collaborative project with the writer Terry Tempest Williams. Uh, it's a project called Prism Species, and we're also we're really looking at that that side of relation and and um, and thinking about these two locations that we're just we're just anchoring them in our own experiences. And mine is on Lake Superior because I have had this deep connection to that body of water and place. And hers with the Great Salt Lake. She's written many like so much about Great Salt Lake. And really thinking again, like I'm, I'm filming in a different way. What's it's, um, it's a little bit um, rocky or something. Or I, I want you to really not be able to quite get uh, your focus, and then you go in and out of focus to amplify the sense that the, there's another kind of experience happening. The end of my own human experience, or yours as the viewer, right? And then the beginning of an animal or an entity's experience. So. Um, that's a that's a new project, and it will take another year and a half or something to get to a real form. Will probably be a like multi-screen installation, and then in tandem with that, we're working in Natural History Museum collections as well. So, thinking about extinction and the complexity of those collections on a lot of levels, but also the the beauty of the collections as complex as the reasons and the the histories of how they you know these species have been collected is that you have this uh, ability to hold still and really honor the complexity of a, of a creature and, and visually kind of like climb into the details of another body. So that's part of it. Um, and then I'm working on a book I'm writing. Mm -hmm. if, as you can see, I've been traveling for years and had these deeply profound experiences and I'm kind of metabolizing. I think a lot of people had this experience in COVID where you're like, er, you know, everybody stopped mm -hmm. and, I'm like, oh my God, I haven't caught up with myself. I haven't even really, you know, told myself my own story in a way to, and trying to think about how it can be useful right now. Um, you know, when you're in your own life, it does, feels normal or something. And then I'm sort of registering that I have this very bespoke kind of set of skills and understandings that I'm hoping I can turn into something useful. So the writing is another thing. And the Guggenheim, there's a, project too that's dealing with the coast coastlines as a kind of metaphoric liminal space thinking of thresholds um, but both as possibility and problematics you know yeah so long answer but lots mm -hmm. of things going on in my head yeah oh you want a oh, mic yeah <laughs> Um, hi, thank you hi, so much yeah. for the lecture. Yeah. Um, I have two quick questions. Sure. Uh, the first is, I want to know if your change of like mindset of like becoming more aware of like your relationship with like nature and like bigger things. Yeah. Uh, did it happen like in a certain moment when you were like, oh yeah, like now I realize this, or was it something more like gradual mm. because you've done like a lot of field work, was it like building up? Yeah. And the other question is, um, how do you think that like regular people <laughs> yeah. that don't have access to like field work and like being in contact with nature in such a close way can experience like this change of like awareness mm -hmm. that you experience and that I think is very important for us yes. humans. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, for the first question, um, it was, I think it was gradual, that coming into a sense of sort of embodied know, knowing. Um, 
I, and I, and I think, I think again, the slowdown of COVID was part of it, but also that there's this, there was sort of this breaking point of where dissonance, when I was making that, I don't think I understood I was dealing with a lot of grief in, even in making that film, that video piece. Um, it took a while. And I think partly because we're not in cultures where like grief is named or held, there's no container for it. And if anything, divinity school taught me, honestly, it was how deeply we need containers for moving through difficult emotions, especially. And they're just going to inherently be part of what we're moving through right now, right? And I think a really important part of um, moving through the times that are coming and that we're in are finding ways to, to do that work, that grief work, that, you know, really like coming into a relationship around, yeah, just our, our like full bodily reaction. So um, it's interesting. I think some of it's come out of, I just, yeah, yeah, I think that really the first year of divinity school, I just grieved the whole year. I really did. It was just profound. Um, and I didn't even, under I could sort of not function in a certain way that was, really healthy actually you know it sounds strange to say <laughs> to say that but now I know if like some wave comes up I have to make space and be move through it right and it's I'm learning still learning how to do that and I think that's sort of what I want my work to help with so to segue into the second answer question um I think what we did today as a group so was a little bit of my trying to figure out th that answer. And so what, what we did do today was do a kind of exercise where um, I was talking through this sense of what does it look like to experience your full bodily design, right? Your set of full set of senses and really have this embodied experience, presencing kind of, right? And what's it look like to practice that? And then what happens, just paying really deep attention to what happens. And you can be in any like natural space. You can be with like a tiny house plant <laughs> in the middle of the city and do it, right? You really, you can. It's not as obviously as like profound as being in the middle of a rainforest or something. Um, and you can do it with your pets. You know, there's this way that you can really shift into the in-between that I'm trying to get to. Um, and I think it is it's just a pra it's a practice that we really need to do together too, right? So we're social beings, so grief you can't do alone. You can't, you just can't do it alone. You really can't, we are not me meant to do that. And also like there's something really profound to about doing that kind of work with each other. Like today was really nice for me too, to be honest, like to have this exchange and hear what came up for people. And um, so maybe it's even having a buddy, <laughs> you know, like having someone you do it with regularly. Um, and building a practice of just finding a way to really try to be un untethered from um, the overly visually dominated kind of like worlding we're in with technology to get back into our bodies, right? So hopefully that's kind of helpful. Yeah, thank you. That was that. great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, bueno, mi, my, my question <laughs> is um, I really like your writing, so I was wondering if you can tell us more about your process, mm. or how do you, when I write a piece, if you have like a diary, or it's just like, mm. so yeah, that yeah. is my question. Yeah, um, the writings come in like fits and starts. Mm -hmm. So um, being in an academic environment, it's been challenging for me to try, have to try write in an academic voice, which I don't like at all. Um, I know how to do it. I, you know, it's part of it's been part of my job in a lot of ways. I know how to teach people to do it, but I actually think it's missing all this other stuff. So, I I think that I've become I've become interested in writing as a kind of almost like a technology where there's different types of writing that have different goals in terms of how you're translating right a a message. And in the case of this kind of writing, and the, the reason I only I haven't published this before, but I, this is maybe the sixth or seventh time I've done it as kind of a performance or something. It's important to me, it's like oral, almost like oral tradition to have you in the space and, and I am in my voice and my body and in my grief when I'm reading it. Um, so it's a very different kind of writing and I have to kind of, it's kind of maybe similar to like re really letting the work through. That kind of writing, I have to be like in this deeply vulnerable, space to, to let it through. So some of the, <laughs> it, it's hard to do in your daily life and you know what I mean? So you kind of make containers for it and so it, it comes in, I don't have a really tidy answer <laughs> to be honest. 
sometimes I just have to get it out, and you know, and that was this was that this was a form of maybe like really working through holding that grief too at the beginning. Um, so we'll see. The book I'm working on has multiple kinds of writing in it. Some that's more storytelling, and some that's more like this poetic voice. So again, hope that's a good answer. But yeah. Hi, thank you so Hi. much for today and for your talk. Um, I've been, somebody else who I don't remember who, because we've had many class lectures, <laughs> all of whom have been amazing, uh, was talking about uh, urgency. Mm. And uh, it's been playing on my brain today, I guess, with I feel like your work, A, you've been talking about the duration of these projects and also just like the duration of some of the shoots and things like that. Mm. and then in contrast to what's happening with climate change and you very like, mm -hmm. you know, year after year seeing change in this way that is mm -hmm. devastating. And, I, and I'm wondering how you resist the like pull of urgency mm -hmm. or, or how you situate yourself I, I, within that kind of conversation and, and I mean, today we were talking about kind of different times and, and, yeah. and ways times work. And I think our human time, we really love product, production yeah. <laughs> and, and, and making, making product within short time frames. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious if you have either strategies to go against that or, I mean, as you're juggling multiple projects, how... Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> this is, I'm yeah, sorry, I'm now no, no, it, <laughs> But I think part of the like difficulty at asking the question is like part of the complexity, right? You know what I mean? I feel I feel the um, the complexity of the moment in in like how difficult it is to ask the question in a way. Uh, it's a good question, very interesting question, and I think it's actually I'm really inside of this uh, discipline about staying slow. And there's a privilege to that, right? Like I happen to be in a moment where I have this fellowship year and I can, and I'm gift, I kind of gifted to myself. I get to, I, cause I've been pushing so hard for a really long time. And I was, re was really tired. I finally am not so, so tired, but I was just like, you know, just insanely tired. And so I can't be of good use in the world if I'm that tired either. So I, I'm really, I've been starting to kind of like think about it like, the, the, like sleeping has been a focus for the last six months. I'm like, I just get to sleep as long as I need to sleep. And I'm, I'm, no, I'm not gonna judge it. I'm not gonna let anyone judge it, you know, like that. I need rest and I need like accumulative rest. And so sort of little rules like that have helped me slow down and start to, I, we were talking this, about this a little bit today about trusting my body. I was really ignoring it a lot, a lot. And we live in cultures that, right, thrive on us <laughs> ignoring our bodies, right? And that productivity is like really um, can be really unhealthy to the to the body, right? Even if it's like you get a lot of you know, stimulation and maybe out of, as a creative person. Um, so I think there's urgency in the back. There's always this, you know, this is happening all the time in the background too. Anxiety about the, what I know is happening and what we're all feeling. Um, and then also knowing that some of it is, is this is going to get political, but tied to capitalist structures, right? Like who benefits from everyone being so overproductive, right? And being tired all the time, actually. If you're rested, you can have these much more complex, nuanced thoughts that might change things too, right? So I am mind I'm like mindful of that. Um, and I, yeah, I think there's just... Pleasure Activism is a book by Adrian Marie Brown. I, yeah, that I'm sure you know as a dancer, right? <laughs> um, but but right. So the, there are these these uh, philosophies I think that are really useful um, around, you know, remembering we're also designed for joy and play, and that we kind of need that. That's where we actually learn the most most of the time. Fear isn't the location of learning. You shut down your body, shut down your brain, shuts down. So to also the shame-based culture, that's a huge part of academia, by the way. So, you know, thinking about how do I climb out of like, even just like built-in shaming around whatever, if it's sleeping in or productivity or whatever, right? So there's a, it's, it's just, 
um, the tidy way to end, end the answer. <laughs> it's just I'm working on it, you know, I'm really, and I'm trying to find, like, I actually like being productive. Sometimes I love being, like, deep in it and, and exhausted myself, but I absolutely, I'm getting better at, like, if I want to do that or I do that. Even today, like, I love this stuff, and I'm going to be so tired tomorrow, <laughs> you know, but, it, but I, so I'm like, know it, I know it, so tomorrow I will take really good care of myself, right? And so building it in, you know, right, this, like, care of the body and the self and the slowness and the mindfulness of, like, the crash and all that. And that's part of being creative, too, is always, like, you know, there's up and down. So, yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll try to be quick. So uh, coming, I come from a culture where, specifically in current scenarios, spirituality, divinity, sacred, the, these words kind of become like debris of regressive religion, mm -hmm, uh, like mm -hmm. enforcing some really problematic ideas. Sure. And I have spent a good amount of time coming out of that zone. And like, so, so, so when these words come across. Yeah, they're like. It's mm -hmm. just like a, a big distance which I mm -hmm. maintain. And, and, and how, how do you, how, like, what way do you formulate your practice or your process of think, yeah. thinking to incorporate these words or yeah. these yeah. belief system, if I may say so, mm. in a way that it doesn't go that wrong territory mm -hmm. while also uh, flourish in a reasonable and rational environment? Say, say the last part of that. Like, and, and they flourish in a oh, reasonable and, 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 and a rational reasonable. environment. Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to semantics, right? So this is something I've been very careful. Even when I sometimes say, like, I went to divinity school to look at, consider art as a space of spiritual holding, I actually always say existential holding. You know, for some people, that spiritual spirituality is a trippy, you know, tricky, tricky word. And the sacred, sacred's a tricky word. But secret is also meaning, meaning making, you know, right? So, um, and for me, I think I'm just get. I'm not religious, and I also sort of grew up a little bit allergic to, <laughs> to it, to be honest. And I'm kind of like a baby Buddhist, like it's embedded in the way I think anyway. You know, I lear learned that in divinity school. I was like, oh, I'm actually like kind of a Buddhist. And in, Buddhi in Buddhis Buddhism, B Buddhism, Buddhism, anyone can be part of Buddhism. It's like designed so that there's, you know, there's this uh, openness. It's your own journey. Um, there's something I really love about about that um, inclusivity of the practice and the sort of honoring of it. So I think um, maybe inside of finding some comfortability in being part, maybe a little bit Buddhist, <laughs> but not, you know, I, I'm not fully comfortable, like, diving into the whole dogma of it because it feels inauthentic for me. But I also, um, like I also mentioned at the beginning, indigenous ways of knowing, I came to them kind of, they were embedded in my upbringing. Actually, I grew up in Berkeley, and we, we learned about the Miwok people. When I was young, I did an exchange with a Zuni reservation. Like, I just have, it was, and it was, I was little. It was, I, I didn't, it was normalized for me to be um, in, in these exchanges with cultures. And I also traveled to Australia and New Zealand when I was in college, and we worked with, was so lucky to work with this group of Aboriginal um uh, folks that were just generously, you know, they're very understandably not trusting of any outsiders, especially white outsiders, and they really were so generous and let us into their world, their worlding, and, and then the Maori as well, this Maori community. So I happen to just have this gift of, of a trajectory that allowed me to be exposed to thinking that just landed deeply with me intuitively, right? And um, so that's why I name it, because it's like, and even in divinity school, there were moments when I would get infuriated by uh, conversations in the room that were leaving out indigenous, they sort of talk about something like it was new thinking. I'm like, that's not new thinking, you know, that's like ancient thinking. And there's been this erasure of voices that, you know, I would always be like, <laughs> by the way, you know, like, nope, that's indigenous, those are indigenous ways of knowing. So. I, maybe that's, again, it's a convoluted answer, but it kind of, I think it's, again, it's something I'm working out, and I 
what are the words that I'm comfortable with is a different conversation than the mindfulness of how I talk so that a secular public that may have this kind of like ventricular location in the conversation will hear it and climb into it and be able to find their own meaning, meaning making, right? Um, and stay with that site, right, of, of like profundity. Um, it's, and another, it's another good question right now. And that's why I went to divinity school. It's like, how do I find the language, right, to make sure we're, we're still talking about the sacred? It is sacred, it is sacred. And our pract creative practices are spiritual practices. I think spirituality and creativity are wi also wildly threatening to capitalist thinking. Um, the most, right, if you just think about the history of like indigenous thinking, witch trials, all of them are about embodied knowledge, paganism even, like early Christianity, all of it, right, is the erasure of this powerful other way of being that is deeply embodied and entangled, right? So, and I think creativity is that too. So we are <laughs> strangely, <laughs> like dangerous to that, right, that like s frame of, um, what's the right, or our sort of force in the world, but also the most Im important. So I, I take seriously too, like even what we did today, I hope is just like kind of helping you guys get comfortable, right? Climbing into like a sacred practice, right? Whatever, and you can use different words, you know. <laughs> Find the so. word that feels good, right? Or the frame, framing, right? Um, so they were like, I'm helping perpetuate like a healing around what's going on because we gotta we gotta get uh, back I, to I, that. I think I, I will go for the meaning making. Practice. Yeah. Okay. Me meaning it. making. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank thank you. Okay. <laughs> One more. <laughs> okay. Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, you talk about slowness and lot and mindfulness within your practice, mm. and it seems with a lot of the tools that you use are, are often quite slow formats of working with like large sure, format yeah. five by four yeah. uh, these sort of long videos which pulling out in and out of focus yeah, yeah. so wondering is, is that always intentional within your practice and mm. um, as a photographer myself I often struggle to be mindful and be present when I'm documenting and mm. being mm -hmm. in these environments so mm. I'm curious of how you try to be present whilst yeah. you're sort of experiencing your subject through like a, another through mediation, scene. yeah, yeah, that's like a great question. Um, I actually think for me, uh, whatever the recording tool helps me be even more present. Actually, um, I think there are forms of using my phone where I am not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where I'm like, oh, I had this for dinner or something, whatever. That's different. But in the w yes, the slowness. I think almost all the work I shared with all of you today, because the group got a, a different glimpse into other work too, is the 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 um, camera. It's mostly been the camera, but sometimes it's now recording sound and stuff. Excuse me. The the um, camera gets me to. I can even feel my body shift thinking about it. I get really present, and I can kind of like channel into this like receptive self. Um, so it's been, in it's interesting, because I do think it can be a very othering tool or block you, or you're just like actually not really having the experience when you're using cameras and et cetera. But I think almost always in my, and that's why it's really hard for me to be around other people when I'm shooting. I, I, I have like a visceral response. I don't want anyone near me. Um, because I actually, it feels like this moment of sacred connection, right? It really does. I think that's where I was like, oh, this is a spiritual, pra this is definitely a spiritual practice because I am suddenly like, okay, I'm, you know, um, I'm, li I'm, I'm in collaboration most in almost everything you're seeing. It's, it's, I don't know if any of you, <laughs> maybe all of you have had this experience where sometimes you make something and you're like, I don't know, did I make that? I don't know if I made it. So it feels very strange. It's weird, right? It's a strange thing as a creator where you're like, bizarre, I made that. Something called me to make it. And again, this is like, gets a little complicated with, conversation, whatever, it's a spiritual conversation, but um, I did not grow up believing in God or having this, like, you know, again, dogma as a thread, but I do believe deeply in, in energetics and, like, connection and something, ha especially working with animals, that something hap I can now have just honed it, kind of, I can almost even in a city, I can call them to me. <laughs> it's 
where we're, when Leah's here, and we've had a couple moments of, so maybe animals will show up, you know, um, usually when we're in California, but um, there is something, it has to be a kind of alchemy, though, and the camera's weirdly part of it, you know, I'm waiting to have this moment to be in it, or I'm waiting for the breath of the forest, and I, you know, right, so another really good, good and interesting question, right, it's like mediation, is, there's, it can be both things, separate you, also get you really present, right, like help you, like listen with your whole body, so, yeah, yeah, you want to come back? Okay, I think that we would be able to continue forever, but I think that yeah. <laughs> we have, we thank you very much, Christina, yeah, thank for you your everybody. time today. Thank you, everybody, thank you for being here. Yeah. And uh, I just want to remind everybody that the next lecture is on Wednesday with Meta Heaven, and this time it's going to be online, so I invite you to tune, to connect to Fabrica's website, and also to follow up the lecture, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Christine. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.